You're listening to Thursday Night AMP on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Thursday night, AngryMarks.com Pro Wrestling and Mixed Martial Arts Podcast. My name is Stevie J. Tonight we're going to preview TLC. I've got two men on the line to help me do that, starting with the great Sudoku, Jason Harlan. How's it going, Angry Marks? we got a great show coming up for you, which is more than I can say for the show we're going to review, but we'll get to that in a moment. Yes, indeed. We have TLC coming up on Sunday. It doesn't seem like they've done much to build up this show, but we'll figure out if it's going to be any good with our other co-host, the one and only Mr. Parrot Shirt himself, Jordan J. Garber. It's great to be here on Angry Marks, of course. We're about to talk TLC, and definitely it's going to be exciting. It's an exciting event coming up, and I'm looking forward to talking about it. Well, I'm glad somebody's looking forward to it, because I'm sure a lot of the WWE Universe is not. In fact, after Raw... After 10 minutes of listening to Roman Reigns trying to get the crowd chant tater tot, this isn't the way you build up a pay-per-view. This isn't going to get me excited about watching a pay-per-view on Sunday. What did you think, Jordan? Yeah, you know, you look at Raw, and you look what happened last week, and I thought it was an improvement from all the other Raws. I think what they did is they had to bring back all these guys because they knew they needed to save ratings. And they did that. They had a good episode of Raw, but the build-up for this pay-per-view wasn't too good, like you brought up earlier. Now, uh, that's not going to take away from it being a good pay-per-view. They could always surprise us and pu- uh, pull a few curveballs. But the problem is is that they're not building it up properly. And in order to have people to buy your product and your pay-per-view, you got to build it up. you got to sell it. And they're not getting the job done in that category. But, you know, looking at the card, seeing Rhino return, seeing all seeing this whole storyline going with the uh, ECW originals and the Wyatt family kind of gives me a glimmer of hope that this event's going to be a success. And we're going to find out if the event is a success this Sunday. Oh, tater tot, tater tot, tater tot. I just don't see that as a way to sell anybody on wanting Roman Reigns to beat Sheamus. If that's the best you can come up with is that Sheamus is Irish, Irish people like potatoes, but he doesn't have any potatoes, so let's all chant tater tots at him. Is that really the best the writers could come up with? I'm tired of watching these scrubs. This pay-per-view ain't getting no love from me. <laughs> Throwing it right back to there. But yeah, potatoes, I mean, yeah, why don't we, it's Hanukkah. Let's make some Locky jokes while we're at it, while we're talking about potatoes. Jeez. I'd like to see Seamus get actually potatoed in the head. That that would be fun, because Seamus' champion just sucks. I was going to watch Raw this week, and Stevie was like, no, save yourself three hours of your life. Don't watch Raw. And I'm like, Sweet, I won't watch it. So, yeah, looking over the card for TLC, I'm kind of glad that I did. Do you think it's kind of become backwards now that it's actually to the point where we're telling people not to watch Raw and to skip it and watch the pay-per-view instead? Have they failed on that epic of a level that we're actually advising people now not to watch Raw? Well, that's always not the right thing to say, um, because, you know, every episode every week could change, and... You know, wrestling right now, the state it's in, it's not what it used to be in the 80s. So telling people not to watch something is not really encouraging it. If you're you're a wrestling fan saying that to a fellow wrestling fan, I'm never going to tell anybody not to watch Raw. I'm going to say, oh, it hasn't been good lately. But you always have to have hope that it's going to be good the following week. Sometimes they delivered, sometimes they didn't. But I wouldn't say to somebody, oh, uh, don't watch Raw, but watch the pay-per-view. At least you get something more to look forward to in the paper if you watch Raw, even if it's a shitty product. It, even if if that makes any sense of what I'm saying. 
because if you're watching Raw before the pay-per-view, you're going to get even more motivated to watch the pay-per-view, even if it's absolute shit. At least you know what's going on in the pay-per-view, and at least you're informed on it. One of the things that stuck out to me about the pay-per-view was just how disproportionate in length it seems to an average episode of Raw. We've got six matches on this card, which will probably end up with a show that is shorter than your average WWE Raw broadcast, you know, commercials included and whatnot, but but still, it seems odd to me that there that this pay per view only has six matches. Where I'm used to doing the New Japan stuff, where even you know their some of their road two shows will have you know nine matches on it at a minimum. And what do you gentlemen make of a pay per view with only six matches on it? I actually look at it as a blessing in disguise. Like, thank God this show isn't going to be as long as Raw. No, you know what? I look at it and I say, you know what? It's a pay per view. And you never know what happens in a pay-per-view. That's why I'm not going to speak down on the event. Yeah, it's not the strongest card that we've seen this year. Not even close. But you never know. Never say never. And that's why I'm going to I'm gonna see some potential on this pay-per-view. It's gonna, but the most it's ever going to be is this pay-per-view is mediocre. It, mediocre to a little bit good. This pay-per-view is not going to be fantastic, but at least watch it and see. It might be at least somewhat decent. Well, let me ask you, Jordan, what was the one thing on Raw that really screamed to you, I'm excited about this match on Sunday? What did the best job of selling it to you? Because I already said that the whole Tater Tots thing didn't sell TLC to me, but something on there must have piqued your interest. What about the um, Rhino returning and that ECW Originals versus Wyatt Family match? That's pretty exciting. I, you know, I think I was actually expecting Spike Dudley I, I'm not saying Rhino wasn't a good surprise, but, I mean, they already went outside of the Dudley boys when they got together with Tommy Dreamer, so when they were teasing that they were going to bring a family member, I really wanted it to be Spike, so I'm not saying... That would have been cool. Right. I, I think it would have been better if it had been Spike, because you know they're going to bury Team ECW, and it's only going to hurt Rhino's credibility as he's coming up through the NXT ranks. Yeah, You well, guys got to remember, too. For me, as a wrestling fan, watching Raw as a wrestling fan, seeing Rhino return gave me a huge pop. Because you know the history I have with Rhino. You know the interview I did with him in 2014. So seeing that, I wasn't like jumping up in the air excited. I was just saying, oh, cool, Rhino's back. What a cool thing to see. It kind of got me more motivated for the match. Just because in 2014, I had the honor and privilege to interview Rhino. And from that experience, I enjoyed seeing him back in the WWE as a fan. And that's why I'm looking forward to that match. That's what stood out to me at Raw. And obviously everyone's opinion is going to vary. But my opinion stands with the um, with that matchup. It's a good thing to see in my perspective. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I'm glad you found something because I didn't find anything. So I that that to me is a plus that they converted one person off of watching Raw, if, even if it's only one. Yeah, exactly. And... You do have a point there, Stevie. Not everyone's going to have that same personal effect when they see Rhino return. Because some, for many wrestling fans watching wrestling today, that may have been the first time they've seen Rhino. They may not know who Rhino is, or they may just not like Rhino. They, they're not going to have the same fan base for Rhino like I do. So seeing me seeing Rhino return is cool, but the question is, are other people excited about that same effect? Well, you know what? With Rhino, I actually think they're getting the people who are going to be excited about it because those are the only people that are left at this point watching Raw. With the audience declining each and every week, almost week-to-week basis, it may go up a little and then it goes down even more, then you're only getting the hardcores left. You're getting the people who remember that Rhino was in WWE 10, 12 years ago. You're getting the people that remember he was in ECW 15, 20 years ago. My God, this guy has been around forever. He's got, like, the Undertaker length of career now. So people but should know. Here's another point. Go here's ahead. Here's another point. Look at WWE's audience today. It's a PG audience. Most people that are watching wrestling right now are children. Now, are these children watching wrestling for the first time, being introduced to it, are they going to care that Rhino's back? No. Now, there's many hardcore wrestling fans that still watch WWE, but WWE is growing and growing with children viewers. So that's where the numbers are going down, is because they're bringing back these people that no one remembers. And wrestling's changed. It's not ECW. It's not the ECW era anymore. 
I tell me, I wish it was, but it's not. The era has changed. So not a lot of people, like I said before, not a lot of people are going to have that same effect on Rhino returning because many people might not remember Rhino. Is part of the problem with WWE right now is that they're trying to appeal to the hardcores by bringing back veterans when instead they should be trying to appeal to the new generation of fans by bringing up the new guys like the NXT roster? Um, I mean, I guess one thing that, that works in their favor is with, with things like, like their Facebook and like the network where if a younger fan wants to, is curious and wants to find out more about Rhino, they can go online and watch a history of Rhino's various matches but at the same time i think wwe is doing a horrendous job of building new superstars they're holding on to um i love ecw ecw is one of my favorite federations of all time so you'll excuse me when i say they're holding on to these ecw relics and putting them in a pay-per-view when they could be building and making new stars which is is kind of one of my big gripes with sheamus holding the big belt right now but but yeah, I mean, I think younger fans, if they are interested, they can certainly, you know, go off on their own research who Rhino was, who Tommy Dreamer was, who the Dudley Boys were, what, what ECW is. You know, that's certainly out there on the internet to find. But at the same time, yes, WWE does need to do a better job of having established superstars put over new guys. Let's go ahead and break down this pay-per-view and see what there is to see if there's anything here that's going to lure people in to be excited. And... I'm going to start with Alberto Del Rio versus Jack Swagger. And my problem with this is I feel like WWE already killed this before the match even took place by having Alberto Del Rio blow off Seb Coulter and say that he was going on his own. Shouldn't that have been the payoff to him losing to Jack Swagger and getting frustrated? Wouldn't that have been more of an impactful storyline? I'm going to start with Jordan on that. I totally agree with you, Stevie. To see... Alberto Del Rio turn on Seb Coulter at the pay-per-view would definitely have a bigger effect. That happening on Raw, with the viewers going down, uh, that's very questionable. But Alberto Del Rio, Jack Swagger, I believe we're doing the picks today too, CB, right? Yes, we're, we're doing picks as well. All right. I still got to find out my um, overall win-loss record. Hopefully I'm doing good. But for this pay-per-view, I'm going to have to say that Alberto Del Rio is going to go over on Jack Swagger. He just returned to the company. He just won the title, and Jack Swagger has been very quiet as of late before um, being involved in another storyline. He's been just competing on main event and superstars. Nothing special going on with Jack Swagger right now. And Alberto, the momentum he has, new to the company, just winning the title, it's not time for him to lose the belt yet. So uh, Alberto Del Rio is going to win this matchup. All right. Jason, your thoughts on the match and your prediction on a winner? Boy, yeah, there's like three points I want to hit here. Yeah, first you were talking about Alberto Del Rio leaving Zeb Coulter, and while I agree it would be a good thing to have him kind of ditch him there, especially in a match with Jack Swagger on the pay-per-view, I think they're shying away from that with some shenanigans and perhaps a double turn in an event later in the night, a match later on in the night, that I think they might think that Del Rio kind of ditching Zeb Coulter might overshadow that. Um, that said, why in the hell are you having a chairs match? I didn't even know a chairs match was a thing until I pulled up the preview for this pay-per-view, and apparently there have been some dispersed through TLCs here and there going back to 2009, but a chairs match? Yeah, um, I think Alberto Del Rio is going to win. I'd really like to see him do that uh, Juji Gatame move with like a chair around Jack Swagger's arm. I don't think that'll happen, but I, uh, Del Rio is too new to the company, too new with the championship. He's not going to drop it to someone like Jack Swagger, especially on a, pe- a pay-per-view as mediocre as this one's going to be. You know, now that they've already blown off the storyline, I'm just going to go ahead and say that Alberto Del Rio goes over clean on Jack Swagger, and he goes back to doing matches on Tuesday nights if you still get WWE main event. And if not, superstars on the WWE network, he may even be relegated to that. But poor Jack Swagger at this point, and I like the guy. I personally think he's a great wrestler and a great talent and has more charisma than a lot of the guys that they currently have that they use in higher profile positions, but they've just slotted Jack Swagger in this spot and they're not going to let him out of it. So what can we do about it? Nothing. Remember too, four years ago, Jack Swagger was on top of the world. He was the world champion. He had all the momentum going his way. And now you look at him right now and it looks like, 
he's literally gone from on top of the world to the bottom of the company, and it's not it's not good for him. He deserves more indeed. He does, but he is gainfully employed, so we'll at least give him that. So, ECW Originals, speaking of gainful employment, they've brought a lot of people back for this match. It's now Bubba Ray, Devon, Tommy Dreamer, and Rhino against the expanded Wyatt family of Bray Wyatt, Braun Strowman, Luke Harper, Eric Rowan. Jason, since you have vowed many times on this show that you're one of the ECW faithful from way back in the earliest days when they made Pittsburgh and Philadelphia their top two markets... What do you think about this? How is it going to go? I think Vince McMahon Jr. will never, ever pass up an opportunity to bury ECW, and this is not going to be an exception to that rule. I mean, it's nice to see the Dudley Boys bringing guys like Tommy Dreamer and Rhino back into the fold, but the truth is, I believe the last two pay-per-views, the Wyatt family has lost and has looked kind of weak in the process of losing. The Wyatt family definitely needs a win to continue to have any kind of credibility that they are monster heels. And yeah, you're bringing guys like Tommy Dreamer in who wasn't even with the company. You're, you're bringing Rhino up from NXT. Um, the Dudley boys are about as over as like stale milk. So I don't think that there's really any harm in jobbing out the ECW guys. As much as I loved ECW back in the day, I think the Wyatt family needs the rub. And unfortunately team ECW is going to go down on this one. All right, Jordan. Your thoughts, Team ECW up or Jason Team has, ECW down? Jason has a very good point on the Wyatt family needing to win this matchup against the ECW Originals because if they don't, then they're going to have to turn babyface just because, like Jason said, they have no momentum going in their way. They're losing credibility as monster heels. If they lose this matchup, they're going to become a babyface. That is not going to happen. We're going to have the Wyatt family win against the ECW Originals. Um, and that's the, that's just, that's just the way it's going to happen. You know, ECW is back in the WWE. You know how ECW was in the WWE. You know their history. Uh, Wyatt family is going to go over. This is going to be an opportunity to put the team over as monster heels and uh, just start a new era. And uh, this is what's going to happen. And uh, the Wyatt family is going to win this matchup. I'm going to make it three for three. I predict the Wyatt family goes over as well. And the ECW Originals, if they stick around after this, will uh, be relegated to the mid-card or below, because the Dudley Boys at this point pretty much are. So teaming with them is actually going to be a downgrade for Dreamer and Rhino, sadly. What are you going to do? Well, hey, at least they're back in the company for a bit. Yeah, well, as has been pointed out, Rhino kind of already was, because he was working with NXT and helping get those guys ready for the main roster, so... Maybe he'd actually be better off just going back to NXT and doing that some more instead of sticking around on Raw. I don't know. I kind of, I, I kind of think he should mix it up a little bit. See him on Raw a few times. See him on NXT. Either or, it's good to see Rhino back on Raw. Being on a different show is always good, and it's been a long time since he's been on Raw. To, so to see that happen uh, is definitely a good thing. All right. Well, hopefully this next match will be a good thing, Charlotte with, of course, her father, the Nature Boy Ric Flair, at ringside, versus Paige. Now, why can't they bring in Paige's mom if they're going to bring in Charlotte's dad? Jason, what do you think? This is this is the basket that I think WWE Creative is putting all of their eggs into. This is where I see the double turn happening. I see Charlotte winning this, but I see it with, with some underhanded shenanigans. I don't want to say dirty deeds because that's a finisher of somebody else on the card. But yeah, I mean, there's going to be some shenanigans and some chicanery. Ric Flair is definitely going to be involved. I think they're... They're going to pull the trigger with Charlotte turning heel or at least really advance the storyline where Charlotte is turning heel while at the same time also turning Gothy McEmo face in her loss by ill-gotten gains with Charlotte retaining the title. I mean, you may even see a disqualification with Charlotte intentionally getting disqualified and keeping the title, and that may further that, you know, Charlotte is Ric Flair's daughter, the dirtiest player in the game, and that, I mean, that would be a great way to further the storyline and further the double turn that I see coming. Well, do you see a double turn here, Jordan? What do you think? I just think it's going to be a basic matchup. We're going to have Ric... Actually, you know what? I take that back. There is going to be a double turn. Why would they have Ric Flair as a manager in this matchup with, for no reason. I know Ric Flair, Charlotte, dad, blah, blah, blah. But, um, I, you're right. I think, uh, we are going to see a double turn. I'm going to have to agree with Jason on this one. Just because Ric Flair, remember guys, he's the dirtiest player in the game. And, uh, that might take effect this Sunday as, uh, Charlotte faces Paige. Yeah, they've been teasing it enough on Raw that 
it seems inevitable at this point for Charlotte to turn heel, though her turning won't really turn the audience because I think anybody that already likes Charlotte won't care whether she's a heel or a face. They'll just want Charlotte to be Charlotte, so it won't even matter. Yeah. I have to agree with you on that because, yeah, it, with the women's the women's division, it really doesn't seem to matter who's face and who's heel because the action the action takes much more center stage than anything they do storyline, and I think that is a big plus for the women's division. I will not call it the divas division. I think that's kind of a big plus for the divas division that, in spite of whatever storylines are there, it's the in ring action that takes center stage, and I wish that would happen more often with some of the men's matches. True, but you did hit on a point that heel face doesn't matter, and it should, but how can it when the Bellas are randomly heel or face every single week? Exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's some room for that with, with guys like Kevin Owens. When they take on, say, a John Cena, he suddenly becomes face. I can understand that. And then everybody else, he's heel. But yeah, when the Bellas are kind of hot shot in between face heel, face heel, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. I mean, they've tried establishing Paige kind of as a heel, and WWE kind of wanted to really retract the statements that she had made about Reed Flair, and they're trying to kind of flip the script on that now. You know, maybe this, maybe the double turn I see coming is kind of damage control for that. But yeah, I mean, in the end, I think it works better with Charlotte as a heel because she is the daughter. She is the progeny of Ric Flair, the dirtiest player in the game. And he should be able to, you know, you should be able to see some of those traits passed down to Charlotte. And the only way to do that is to have her turn heel. Well, speaking of dirty players, the New Day going against the Usos and the Lucha Dragons in a triple threat tag team ladder match. They're the only ones who have three members. They're the only ones who can use Freebird rules. So you've got to expect a, a whole bunch of dirty tricks. Yeah, because they are the New Day, and that's kind of their M.O., and you have to expect that, uh, that what is it, a trombone that... Um, yes, he plays that the Xavier trombone. Woods plays. Yes. Yeah, you gotta, you kind of got to expect that to be going on, too. Um, if anybody would take the titles from the New Day, I think it would be the Usos. I don't see that happening. I don't see any way that the Lucha Dragons, as much as I like them, would, would take the titles. Um, there's two things that's going for the New Day. One, it, they're unintentionally being over with the fans is is great. I can see them keeping the belts on them. As, as Stevie has kind of pointed out in the past, the tag team belts are kind of like a burial, or at least management sees it as a burial, and them trying to continue to bury the New Day and punish them for getting over his faces when they should be heels. And yeah, with, with the three on, three on two on two, I can see the New Day retaining the titles in this one here. All right, Jordan, do you think they retain, or do you think it's a change? Since WWE always throws curveballs, and since I have a history on angrymarks.com of doing this. I do my long shot pick of the day. You never know what, what WWE can throw at you. I'm going to say the Lucha Dragons are going to become your new WWE Tag Team Champions in this ladder match just because they want to surprise somebody. Uh, we brought up at the beginning of this program that um, the, the pay-per-view doesn't look so like stacked up as it did uh, compared to other ones. So they might surprise us. They might throw a curveball, and we might see the Lucha Dragons as your new tag team champions. You know, I'm actually going to side with Jordan on this. I think they need something for people to be talking about the next day, the next week, the next month. And if the New Day gets screwed somehow, since they're already being cheered like faces, even though they're supposed to be heels, getting screwed out of the titles in this pay-per-view would actually turn them full-fledged face anyway. So... Why not run with it? Why not let the Lucha Dragons come out of nowhere and somehow use a ladder to set up the big win? Indeed, and that's what I said at the start. Um, that's what I said at the start of this prediction, and uh, I believe that's what's going to happen as well. All right. Well, Kevin Owens and Dean Ambrose. I'm calling this right now. Owens retains. I love Dean Ambrose, but I see no way, no reason, no how for him to get the Intercontinental Title at this time. It, there's just no point to it. The feud doesn't even seem to have that much momentum in it. Seeing him eat popcorn and drink soda and throw them at Kevin Owens, that doesn't do anything for me. Jordan, what do you say? Yeah, I don't know. This whole popcorn and soda thing, they just have to throw something with Dean Ambrose. As funny as it was to see on Raw, um, there's not a lot, lot going on in this match build-up, and you guys brought that up earlier um, with the uh, build-up to this pay-per-view. When you see Dean Ambrose sipping an iced tea and throwing popcorn at Kevin Owens, 
how is that building up a match? Yeah, and it's just going to piss somebody off. But, like, that's all it's going to do. There's nothing personal. There's no, there's no buildup that makes you really mad. All that did was make me laugh. It didn't motivate me to see that match. All it did was make me chuckle a little bit and then move on to the next segment. So, um, I'm not expecting a lot of this matchup, but, uh, to make a prediction, I'm going to say Kevin Owens is going to retain. Yeah. All right. Jason, clean sweep here. Do we all pick Owens to retain? We're going with the clean sweep. Kevin Owens, as a heel champion, needs to retain the title to maintain that kind of heel monster, rookie monster a la Rhino back in the day kind of vibe that he has. And Dean Ambrose, as the babyface kind of on the outside looking in chaser, it doesn't really hurt him. He can kind of keep whatever momentum or lack thereof and maybe gain some momentum by coming close in this match. Very, very close, but not quite winning. And that's, that is what I see. I see Ambrose coming within a hair of winning the title, but Owens is going to hit that pop-up powerbomb one, two, three. And you know what? I think Ambrose is okay with this because he's probably going to have a much bigger spot in the Royal Rumble anyway. I see him as the kind of guy that a month from now will be in that match. We'll probably get to eliminate four or five people in a row. May not go all the way and win, but he's probably going to get to shine there. Yeah, I can see that. So that leaves one match left on this admittedly short-booked pay-per-view right now. They'll probably throw in a pre-show match. They'll probably have a couple of unadvertised matches to fill some time. And let's hope they do, because otherwise we're going to get a lot of long, boring talking segments and a lot of useless backstage skits that we don't need to see. So let's hope they add a couple matches to this card. But if they don't, one other match is left, Sheamus and Roman Reigns. Jason, your thoughts first. Oh, I think the potato's going to hold on to the title here. Yeah, um, Sheamus, Sheamus is going over in this one as much as nobody, nobody wants to see him go over, but come hell or high water, management has put the title on Sheamus. And it's just, it's just a horrible situation. They should have turned Roman Reigns heel, given him the title. There was so much more you could have done with this, but no, they're going with Sheamus and they're sticking with Sheamus no matter how painful it is. I have to agree here. They've chosen a direction, right or wrong. They're not going to change their minds just a few weeks after Survivor Series. They've had him cash in. They've got him as their top heel now, whether we like it or not. They're going to take, they, they, they just won't pull the plug this early. That's all there is to it. If they think this is a failed experiment, they'll wait till at least the Royal Rumble. It's way too soon. Jordan? Yeah, you know, Seamus just won the title. He just cashed in the money in the bank and won the title whether people like it or not. Personally, it's not the biggest deal for me to see him as champion. It's not like making me like roll over in anger, but you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a long reign, but uh, it's definitely not going to end the pay-per-view after he's won it. So, uh, yeah, Roman Reigns is just going to go down in this matchup. Sheamus is going to retain, and uh, we'll go from there. I see the most likely outcome of this is that he refuses to take another title challenge from Roman Reigns. He'll say, I already beat you after a five-minute title reign, fella. I already beat you at the pay-per-view and a tables, letters, chairs match, fella. I don't have to defend against you, fella. You're at the back of the line. And then what happens after that is Roman Reigns has to force his hand by winning a title shot, by winning the Royal Rumble. Deja vu to last year, but I see it actually being a case where they're going to think, it didn't work last year, we had the wrong build, but this time we got a heel champion that everybody's going to hate. They're going to boo him, they're going to cheer Reigns at WrestleMania. Let's give him the win at the Royal Rumble again. This time it'll work. I I just, they're so dead set on having Roman Reigns be their new top baby face that I just don't see any other way for this to go. I can go along with that, though. I think there's one interesting thing that Jordan had uh, touched on that, you know, Seamus, you know, it's it's not – people just aren't really hating Seamus for the wrong reasons or tuning into Seamus being champion for, for the right reasons. They're not really hating on Seamus the way that they would have. They wouldn't be as up in arms as if, say, Roman Reigns had been made a heel and been the championship. I think a champion – I think a lot more people would tune in because they were pissed off about that, but pissed off more in a storyline way instead of pissed off in a I don't want to watch Raw kind of way because Seamus is the champion and he's fucking boring. You know when people were actually pissed off at Sheamus when it would have actually worked? When? Six months ago when he had those matches with Daniel Bryan, and that was the last time we saw him because Daniel Bryan got another concussion working with him. It, it could have worked, but they, they, they shelved him too long, and they brought him back, and he looked like Dr. Zoidberg. <laughs> I guess so. All right, well, that's our TLC preview, but we're going to get a few other things in before we wrap up the show for this week. So, Jordan... 
Well, you know, got some interviews coming up within the coming weeks. Check that out. Um, besides that, I'm on a few shows coming up. Find out more about that on my Twitter as the announcements happen. And, uh, yeah, speaking of Twitter, follow me on Twitter at Jordan J. Garber and definitely lots more to come in the future. And I'm looking forward to 2016. It's going to be a great year. And, uh, yeah, talk to you guys next week. Absolutely. Thanks, Jordan. And Jason, what about you? What do you have for things to plug? Sure, yeah. Now that the, the unimportant tournament in New Japan Pro Wrestling, the heavyweight tag team tournament is wrapped up, um, we can get underway with some good stuff. The road to uh, Tokyo Dome's Wrestle Kingdom 10 on January 4th is coming up, and two titles that nobody cares about are going to be defended on the road to shows. On the 18th, we have the NWA Junior Heavyweight Championship match between Tiger Mask and Jushin Liger. I couldn't even tell you which one of those guys was the champion. I think Tiger Mask. And then on the 19th, we have the CMLL World Welterweight Championship match between Mascara Dorada and Bushi. So yeah, two titles that I didn't even know were being defended in New Japan, but hey, there you go. And you can see those matches on njpwworld.com. It is the best 999 yen you can spend a month. I'll let Stevie take a look and see what that exchange rate is this month. That's $8.21. A bargain to be sure. Less less than the network. Yeah, I'll plug myself on Twitter too, which is at Great Sudoku. Maybe I'll start live tweeting some of these Road Two shows, and I will definitely be live tweeting Wrestle Kingdom Ten on January fourth. Looking forward to that one. Um, you can check out my vegan cooking blog at veggiebending.wordpress.com. What treats are you going to have for us for Christmas? Because you know there's always a big family feast, so you got to have something ready for that. I gotta have something. Um, one thing that I've been looking at making is a British thing called Garibaldi biscuits, kind of currants, the fruit currants with, um, dough around it. Been looking at that, doing that. So that's, that's one of the things that I want to put up there. Um, and with Hanukkah now, I definitely want to put a vegan recipe for potato latkes there. So Seamus would definitely approve of that one as well. So look for those in the coming weeks. I approve of that as well. Some latkes and some sour cream sounds really good to me right now. Mm hmm. All right. Well, that's what's going on on veggiebending.wordpress.com, and that's what's going on with all of us here on Thursday Night AMP. So we hope you enjoy TLC on Sunday. We hope you're having a good holiday season and continue to do so for the rest of the month. For myself, for Jordan J. Garber, and for Jason Harlan, a.k.a. The Great Sudoku, thanks for listening to Thursday Night AMP, and have a great week, everybody. Fuck it!